Okay, good evening. Welcome to the uh, City of Athens Arts, Parks, and Recreation Advisory Board meeting. Today is May 20th. It's uh, 535, and I'd like to call this meeting to order. Uh, are there any additions uh, or deletions from tonight's agenda? Does anyone have anything they'd like to add or delete? Okay, hearing none, uh, let's move on to the approval of the minutes. Could I, uh, Daniel? Yes, uh, I would like to add, uh, just discuss briefly about Lesser, Salandine, and Sells Park. Okay. Uh, so we'll, what we'll do is we'll move that under, we'll put that under parks. Okay. And, uh, if I'm correct, that's, a, a an invasive, correct, Daniel? That's right. Yeah. Okay. I just want to put that on the agenda here so that when we get to that point, we've got it noted. Okay. My Thanks. apologies. Any, I didn't see your hand. Any other additions or, uh, uh, deletions from the uh, agenda this evening? All right. So let's move on to, um, Minutes. Everyone's had a chance to see those. Caitlin got them out to us. Uh, uh, any additions, corrections, deletions, anything uh, anyone would like to change on the minutes? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the uh, minutes as submitted. I move we approve the uh, minutes as submitted. Greg uh, moves that we approve the minutes as submitted. Uh, is there a second? Second. Travis seconds. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right. The minutes are approved as submitted. <laughs> Moving on to old business. Uh, Sean, uh, Friends of Arts, or Friends of Arts, Parks, and Recreation, any updates that you could share with us today in regards to that topic? Um, <laughs> we've been swamped, actually. Uh, we started on trying to get the wording done correctly for the um, the big long form for the 501c3 or the, the nonprofit status. And there's like pages and pages and pages of things that need to be ironed out. So Terry, Aaron, and I have been hoping to get together to work on that, but I know she's been busy out for a while and Aaron's been busy and then I've been working basically two jobs. So we have a uh, School ends this week, and so does schools, uh, youth sports. So Aaron and I have an appointment Monday evening to get back on this once we can breathe again. So, Terry, do you have anything you want to add? No, um, just exactly what, what <laughs> you said. Uh, as we prepare to move, prepare for summer camp, opening the pool, and a number of other things, we've uh, we've been pressed. Um, so I appreciate your grace um, in in. Uh, just recognizing that, and we've recognized how busy you are. Um, so yeah, if, if we can just agree to reconvene when we can all take a breath, which like you said, Aaron, me meeting um, on Monday, and then maybe after the, the pool opening. That sounds great. Sean, and, and I know what that document, or I should say documents look like. Uh, and I'm sure you've had a chance to look through those. Are there any resources that you're going to need that we need to round up for you, whether that be legal advice, uh, accounting advice, or anything like that? That sounds great. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I was worried about the accounting side, but um, yeah, I, I know that once we get it, it's, it's hard to do it without a narrative. So you need some ideas and an objective and you know something to at least put out there to start identifying areas that you are weak in. But I know accounting is one that I would like to strengthen because you know, if, if if this is very successful, you know, I want I want a, a wide variety of board with lots of different talents and strengths, and you know, who have our backs for everything. And um, uh, what else was it, Terry? I know it was just getting the narrative down of like what we see this board and how it's going to interact with the rec center and types of projects that it's expecting. You know, for our, our status, it's it's insane the level of detail they want. So. Well, in terms of the accounting, at your convenience, if you could uh, maybe shoot me an email of people that you've identified so far as board members or possible board members, uh, I can then, uh, you know, give you a list of possible people that we could contact uh, uh, from the accounting side, uh, making sure that we're covering all bases as you continue to build as diverse a board as possible. Sure, uh, and, and it's always good to have lawyer lawyers' advice on board too. So yeah, yeah. that's that's a good point. So. 
Yeah, if you, can you get, and I can talk later. <laughs> yeah, well, once the last soccer match is over and the last report card is handed out, you've got a chance to breathe. Uh, Tomorrow. You know, sometime Tomorrow. the next couple of weeks would be great if you could do that. Sure, will do. That would be great. Thank you. All right, good, 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 good. Any questions for Sean in regards to Friends of APR? Okay, uh, moving on. Parks. Um, and I'm not sure how we got this under parks, but – that's where it ended up. And that is the bike path. Uh, Daniel uh, gave me a call in the last week, and we had a very extensive conversation about the bike path, some concerns, and uh, some things that we may as a board need to do uh, to strengthen and continue to promote uh, what is uh, basically a world-class biking facility, uh, which will, I think, continue to grow and continue to be attractive particularly as the Baileys continues to develop and more and more people come into Athens. So without any further ado, I'll, I'll turn it over to Daniel. One thing I will say, Daniel, I do have a host of pictures here, uh, which uh, if need be, when you get to those points, I can share with the group so we can visually uh, see some of the concerns that have been identified. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, yeah, I guess I'll start with the the path on the uh, Eastern and so most of you, maybe all of you have seen the, been on the new extension that goes to South Canaan road, uh, from the Holzer clinic area. If you're to head, uh, West, uh, toward town, um, after about when you start actually from Holzer and then especially after you go under the bridge, uh, that the highway overpass, uh, you get a lot this, yeah, this is perfect right here. Um, this section people, you can see drive through it and they'll, they'll turn or whatever, but the rock gets pushed into the path. Um, it's not really ideal even for experienced riders. I've got gotten flat tires in that area before. Um, it just, it seems like something, uh, needs to be done. It's, it's kind of the part where you ride through and you just want to get through. You don't even want to be there. And I've seen, uh, and I see a lot of people come from a long way. I mean, some people re I'm sure are coming from other parts of the country, um, you know, and they seek out places like this. And we do have something very special with 22 or so miles of bike way. Um, and so I, I just feel like if we can get this cleaned up and taken care of, it'd be more of a, uh, you know, it'd benefit Athens it'd benefit just, just our area because once they ride the path then they, you know, what are they going to do? They're going to eat lunch or dinner, you know, or go check out shops. And so, um, I feel like this is a very important asset to, uh, just our community. Um, so that that's one spot there. Um, Daniel, Daniel, before you go on, I after Daniel called Daniel, me, but I, I drove out there, and this is uh, this is thirty three right here, or what used to be old thirty three extension of East State Street. And if you keep going this way, uh, you're going to go under the bridge, and then you get to the four lane. Mm -hmm. So we're headed east, going towards Marietta, towards Belpre. Mm -hmm. um, this is the road right here. I have a four wheel drive, all wheel drive a Toyota Highlander. Had I not been in that vehicle when I pulled in here, these ruts are so deep. I'm not sure I could have gotten out with a normal size car. Some of these ruts are four, six, eight inches deep. Mm -hmm. So what happens when people come out this road, uh, somebody's getting ready to make a left onto the highway here. What they do is they, rather than waiting, they go around, they go into this stuff, dig deep into it. Some people actually get stuck. My old smart car, would still be in there if I had tried that. And they, they run their wheels and stuff, which throws this stuff all over the place. And this extends for a good 100, 150 yards down there, uh, which makes it very, very difficult and dangerous to, uh, to, to ride. So to Terry's point about the map, uh, one of the things I think we need to determine or find out is does this section belong to the city? Does this section belong to the county? Obviously, this is not Ohio University uh, to maintain and then develop a plan to get this maintained. Uh, my wife pointed out to me that something she realized, 
there's no barrier here at all between people going 55 miles an hour and a bikeway not 10 feet apart. Uh, potentially, it's a pretty dangerous area. So not only do we have maintenance, but I think we also have uh, a, a, some potential uh, vehicle, bicycle conflicts. So, Alan, to, um, that is a section, that is a city section there. Um, we maintain up to uh, just before Holzer. Um, and it looks like that is right there um, by Menards. Am I correct? Or is it a different? It's past Menards. Is it beyond Menards? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Menards would be back with, this way. With the, yeah, with the asphalt and gravel that's there, I mean, that's a continual maintenance um, almost daily if we've got traffic uh, that passes through there either turning or um, you know my thought is is there a better solution to what's there uh, so you don't get that rock and gravel kicked onto the bike path I, I would agree I guess the question then is if this is city property uh, <clears throat> What department do we address? Is it EPW? So or is it I've reached out to determine. Pardon? Or is it streets? I mean, you know, I, what, what department so that we can get this resolved? Because it, it will only get worse. And if we get some heavy rains in the uh, in the summertime, which we're prone to do with um, big thunderstorms and things, it's just going to, because of the slope, the water will leave State Street into this stuff and then just carry over onto the bike path and make it even worse. So it's my understanding um, that APR is responsible for bike path maintenance. That's mowing um, along the bike path. Um, and I'm going to, to venture to say that even keeping the bike path free and clear of de debris for the sections that we maintain. Um, this is in an area where there's been new construction. Am, am I correct? Yeah. Uh, or road work. Okay. Well, so I've reached by. out to Jessica. Don I'm sorry. I've reached out to, um, David Riggs from code and Jessica Dine from EPW to determine who the, the appropriate person is to discuss um, with businesses uh, design uh, permitting for um, signage because I think probably what some of Daniel wants to bring forward too is the traffic concern and how the path is marked from a safety standpoint at entrances and exits at, at these businesses as well. Um, so I see that, I see this as a maintenance challenge. Uh, and, you know, but I also, I, I'm wondering if there is something we can do so that doesn't get kicked up on the bike path. I can see maintaining it you know, once a week, um, twice a week, um, having the staff, uh, but I can't see, you know, maintaining that every day. Um, and maybe that's the bigger, you know, the bigger conversation is how do we, you know, with, with the bike path being an important part of, you know, our recreation in this area, um, how do we establish uh, a position or maintenance position to maintain and maybe working with the county and OU to maintain maintain all of the bike path um, and with some consistency. Uh, but I'll say that East State, you know, that that's been a challenge with with the new businesses and new construction. Uh, and I too have been out there and made some observations as far as um, traffic and uh, just how the bike, how those areas are marked. So we're getting into biking season. So we're not talking about this again in August. 
Daniel's a member of the bikeway committee. Um, and, and I would look for another volunteer uh, who would be willing to work with Daniel to take this on as a project to get this thing solved sooner than later. Because we're talking, we're really talking about two different issues here. One is the, 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 the area that I just showed you. Uh, but the other part uh, is, is something you can see in this slide right here. Here's the bikeway. Okay, coming I'm, where, the, where the cursor is, I'm coming from Menards, or excuse me, coming from Kroger's. This is the main entrance to Menards. As you can see, the white line where one is supposed to stop is right here. Yet this truck is clearly pulled into the right of way for the bikeway. Um, I'm not a big fan of putting up a million signs, but a consistent set of signs and lines that say stop here, and you've seen that before, so that people don't pull in here. And what compounds the problem is what compounds the problem is the fact that this is what the person sees, no turn on red. So there's no way that you can pull up to the light, look to your left, see that it's clear, turn right and clear the intersection. And I have no idea why there's a no turn on red here because at this place right here, the speed limit is 35 miles an hour, not 55 miles an hour. So the question for this part of the problem is, signage and things of that nature, who's that? Streets, EPW? Because again, Personally, I don't want to be sitting here in August talking about this. This needs to be solved now. And it seems like a very simple solution if we can get the right people sitting at the table together. There's a classic case of the guy literally sitting in the bikeway. Yeah. Uh, I ride that often myself. And on that slide, the no turn on, on red is probably for the safety of the bike people so that they don't pull up and turn, but that is gonna happen a lot. And also if you're coming from the other direction, from the right side of that truck, the passenger side of that truck, there's no button. They, they put the buttons on the wrong place. There's no button to cross that intersection right there. Uh, the button is to cross uh, 33, to go over to where the highway patrol road is. So coming from the, the new end of the bike path, you have to just judge yourself by the traffic light because the, the signal button does not work going back towards Kroger's. It works going from Kroger's to the end of the bike path, but not the other way. Uh, so they've kind of screwed the button system up on that intersection. But as to your slides before, that, that cinder stretchway is the worst part of the bike path that, that I'm ever on. And I, I always fear, and I always ride to the inside of my wife out of fear of rocks being thrown by tires and hitting us. Um, I mean, I see the solution is why can't we pave that and put a guardrail along there or at least a guardrail. Um, and I've often thought, can we have a volunteer group? I'd be more than happy to volunteer once a week to go with a broom and sweep that section if that's what it takes to help maintain that um, section. But that to me is the worst section of bike path we have in Athens County. Daniel, can I ask you a question, please? Sure. Has the, has the uh, <laughs> bikeway committee addressed this, <clears throat> these concerns in any of their recent meetings? Uh, it, it was uh, maybe a ha six months ago or so it was, discussed um a lot of these points that we hit in this one in particular but i just i felt like action should be taken i mean uh, volunteer groups would be great but i think if something like what greg had alluded to a uh, uh, some sort of a curb and possibly just paving that so it's not vendors <laughs> um and, but having that separation too so people aren't 
able to drive onto the path. I think that, you know, it would, that would be costly, but then the city, the crew wouldn't have to come down here and, and sweep it. Cause there, it would be, you know, hopefully the problem would be mitigated. So, <clears throat> So, Terry, yeah. would, would you be amenable to setting up in the next couple of weeks a meeting with uh, Daniel, yourself, and uh, anybody that would volunteer from from the APR board to uh, take a look at this and, and maybe chart out possible plans and a timeline? Because I, I agree, it's nice to have volunteers and stuff, but we're not, we're not uh, volunteers in this case. We're not addressing the, the problem. And we could sweep every week. We could sweep every day, but a year from now, we're still going to be sweeping. As opposed, well, I don't understand why that's never been brought up in the city before to to pave that that strip. Terry, do you do you know why that's never been brought up to be paved? I do not. Um, but to Alan's point, what I can do uh, is. Yes, absolutely. Set up that meeting. I would like to pull Jessica Adine in on the meeting. Uh, we have a department head meeting on Monday, I believe, on this Monday. Um, I can bring this up as a concern and let them know how we'd like to move forward. Uh, if there's anybody else that needs to be brought in from another department <clears throat> other than Jessica from EPW, uh, I can be sure that um, they're part of this uh, this group to meet to to resolve it. I I, I tend to agree with it being paved um, and not the continual maintenance um, because I can honestly say that um, you know that will be um, will be a challenge uh, with the staffing levels and could be hit or miss uh, and going to get traffic or cars that even after you after you sweep that gravel in that come through there and you know um push it up on the bike path so i like the idea of paving it and then having some sort of barrier there as well um well they'd have to go hand in hand it, and pay the, the motorist right. would just see it as another lane to to, to pass people Right. And was that done by design? Was that done by design with that soft gravel to keep motorists out of there? I, I don't know. No, let's not keep him out of it. But that sounds good, Terry. Uh, if you could do that, that'd be great. Daniel, you had another point, though, you wanted to make, uh, not about this, but another section of the bike path, I believe. Uh, yeah, we, we talked about Menards, but then also two things. Um, at Quidel, there are... <coughs> signs at each entrance it's the east state technical technological park um i had heard that they were supposed to be installed uh before the path so that the car has to stop before the path and then they can cross to get onto the road and they're not they're at the road um and someone on the bike path committee said that that was the intention so i don't I'm, I guess I'm wondering why can't we have them where they were intended to be? I think that would be safer also. A lot of people are courteous there, but if you're not paying attention, uh, you know, which if you're looking at the stop sign as it is now, you're going to drive right through the path. Um, so that was one. And then the other was that picture I saw Alan show um, just a little bit further down the path where you have that, uh, it's like a S bend. You turn curve to the left and then to the right. Is this, I don't know if it's composite or what, but it's a, a large steel plate, Daniel. Yeah, well, they used to have a steel plate, and I said something about it, and so then they put this in. Um, I know why it's there, but I don't know why it's long term. I, I feel like it should be a temporary thing. And every time I ride, if you look to the upper left of that picture, you can see that little pathway going into the parking lot and there's a bollard there. I ride on that parking lot. Every time I don't go over this because it can be slick when it's wet, right? It's in a turn. So it'd be slick if it's in a straightaway when it's wet, but it's in a turn. So it's, even yeah. it's in a bad place. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I feel like, well, so to give you an idea where we are, when you're coming down the bike path and you get down to the end, there's that little parking lot. 
just past the dirty dog car wash. East State Street's up here to the top. Here's a little parking lot. Uh, so you're coming, you're coming this way from uh, City Rec area, past all those businesses, and you get to this point. What they use this for is there are heavy construction vehicles that come from the parking lot across here, crossed down over the bank in that flat area by the river. Uh, I walked down here. I had a good pair of tennis shoes on and uh, went and kind of danced around, so did my best Michael Jackson impression. Over here, everything was fine. But over here, where these guys are coming and there's this puddle, this was wet. And I about fell and broke my backside. And there, you guys are absolutely right, because I threw some more water on there just to see. And when this gets wet, it is slick as can be. So what people are doing, as Daniel said, they come down here and they're cutting through here, which I understand why you would do that. But then now we have bicycles and parked cars and cars coming out of the parking lot all mixing together. May work for an experienced bicyclist, but it's not the design. So again, I would assume we're in the city here because this is closer to town than the stuff we just looked at. Um, if this has to be here for the vehicles coming across, can we look at some alternative material or some material that at least has treads or anti-skid or anti-wet so it's not dangerous, not only to bicyclists, but as I said, I uh, when I got my, uh, over here, uh, you can slip and slide. It's like on ice skates when it gets wet. Yeah, I'd say some kind of textura, textured rubber material overlaid on that heavy plate so that uh, they still have the heavy plate to save the pavement underneath, but yet the overlay rubber, textured rubber material uh, that they could lay over that would help protect the, the cyclists and the walkers and the joggers and the doggers. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was going to say, I don't know. I, I think that that is their... Um, should only be there on a temporary basis. I don't know that they need access all year. I think it's one time a year that they they work a project there at the river and take those trucks in and uh, move mud and whatever else. So um, I don't know that that even needs to be there um, year round, but I, I will definitely find out. I don't think it should. If, it should. And I think it, I think. Right become permanent and that's not the point all right all right if uh and and with these photos is this is that you alan or yeah, your can, photos can, if you uh, can send those i'll email them to you yes ma'am and yep. i will um i will make that part of my report on monday morning um and use the photos as well and let them know that we've discussed this and um yeah. Sounds good. Anything uh, else on the bike path? Uh, yeah, quick question for Daniel, and that's about the stop signs there at the at the research place. Are they consistent all along the bike path? I believe some signs the bike is supposed to yield, and some signs, I don't know if there's any where the bike has to stop. I think there are where it says the bicyclist must stop for traffic. It would be nice to have it consistent the whole path from from 24 to Nelsonville signage wise so that as you ride along, you know that you're supposed to. I'd rather yield to a car and stop at a car than have the car yield to me, um, even though that breaks up the ride. But it's, I think, ultimately safer. But I just wonder if, in your experience if the signage is consistent from one end to the other. If not, I think it should be. It's inconsistent, Greg. I, I when I did that thing, okay. Some places it's it's the stop signs right where you're supposed to stop. Sometimes it's clear up on the bike path. It varies from. I bet there's four different versions of that. Or I didn't yeah. count, but at least four different versions. So again, yeah, you know, who's who's in charge of where the signage goes? Whoever that is needs to have a consistent placement. With the, by the, a person in charge who's the authority person to say, here's where the signs need to go. Please put them there. I don't know who that is. Well, I think we'll get a better idea when I, I agree with you on Monday. 
I, I agree. Um, and with the inconsistency, and my initial observation is that the onus is on, on the person on the bike. And I think if we're a community um, of cyclists, that we need to start educating drivers. And, and, and some of that needs to be uh, modeled in uh, the type of signage, information, et cetera. Um, because I think at each of those interests, um, you know, it, it's, it's, on the, it's on the cyclists. Um, and I think, you know, both need to be aware of the vehicle um, and, and the cyclists. So um, well, I think it's a good, good starting point. Uh, yeah. On that note, I mean, if, we, if we're looking at signage, especially uh, with what you showed at that um, Menard's place where they should stop at a certain point, I think the signage um, should be very explicit. Stop here for bike path safety. So that way that, you know, they are aware that this is why you have to stop here. But I was also wondering, I'm wondering if they go past that, does it not activate the the light so are they sitting there for a long period of time because you know how you can uh, stop here to activate um, or actuate the the light i'm wondering if um th that line there serves the same purpose because if they go beyond that they could be sitting there for a long time travis that, that truck sat there long enough that i could take this picture <laughs> this picture <laughs> and, and walk around four or five others see and that's the probably the there. delay in that light change and that's why he's probably so maybe that could be um something else that another signage or message that needs to to be there because if they're going beyond that they don't realize that if they don't stop at a certain point that light's not going to change or it's going to delay the change yeah all right, so Terry has her meeting on Monday. Uh, I'll get you those pictures. You're going to get us a map. Uh, and then uh, if there are other volunteers that would like to participate when we can get that meeting scheduled to, to uh, in addition to Daniel, that would be great. Um, and uh, hopefully by the time we reconvene on the 17th day of June, uh, we have some clear-cut answers and a, and a, and a plan. Uh, it'd be unrealistic to expect, to expect this to be completed by then, but at least a plan and a timeline because, uh, as you saw there, and, and I've never ridden my bike down there. I've never gone that far, so I wasn't aware of it. And I appreciate Daniel pointing that out, uh, and this is what board members, we need to do, listen to each other, listen to the community, and bring things forward that are going to benefit the whole community. And, Travis, I think your point, while understated, was spot on. That signage can't just say stop here, but by adding for the bike lane or however you phrased it, it puts it in context, and then it becomes a reoccurring thing that people begin to learn. Well, the reason I'm stopping is because of, not just because somebody told me to, it's because of the safety for me and the safety for bicyclists. So I thought your comment was, was spot on in that regard of, of identifying what the message needs to be. Daniel, anything else on the bike path? No, not for now, but thank okay, you. Okay, good deal. Well, you're up after this next topic. Okay. Uh, next topic on the agenda. Um, as you remember from uh, um, a previous meeting when Andrew came, uh, the existing dog park is going to be used as one of five sites for solar arrays that will power many of the uh, city facilities, including the community center, wastewater treatment plant, the, uh, the um, oh, what do you call it? The plant where they do all, the, the building where they do all the measurements and things. So we asked um, uh, Third Sun Solar to provide us with some drawings as to what these, this would look like, what the dog park would look like, and incorporating some uh, courts, both tennis courts and pickleball courts. So let me call this drawing up, these two drawings up. And um, and we can uh, take, take a look about this. And Greg has a lot of input on this. Just bear with me just one second. And then this one I did not call up. Oh, geez. 
Terry, do you remember when they uh, sent that to us? Here it is right here. Okay, this is the first one. So what you're looking at is the existing dog park. Um, the existing dog park and um, the blue would be the solar arrays. Three green tennis courts. This is north up here, so we're good, right, Greg? In terms of this is north up here. No, that's east west layout. I mean north south. Yes, that, yeah. that's the wrong layout. Yes, right. That's that's the correct correct layout, right? No, they need to go the other way. So this is a baseline, and this is a baseline. You don't want the baselines north south. You want the baselines east west. That's north south. Yeah, that's north right there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, here's East State Street out here. Oh, okay. Yeah, here's East State Street out here. So, yeah, there's yeah, and here's, the, there's the high school down yeah. here. So, okay. what we have are three, three tennis courts, four pickleball courts, and all of this is still the dog park. If you notice, right where my cursor is, is the existing fence for the dog park. Runs right across here. If you look closely, there's a thin yellow line. This is enlarging the dog park to compensate for some of the dog park that will be taken up by the solar array. If we go to this drawing, this is version B. If you notice there's additional room at the ends of of the tennis court for possible seating or pavilion or whatever, but still three tennis courts and four pickleball courts. Uh, as it is now, our tennis courts, everyone knows, are down in the floodplain and are in horrible shape. And we've been told repeatedly to go in and fix them up again really is just wasting money because the next flood we get will begin to destroy the courts. Uh, I received an email today from a, a, a community member, um, and I'll just read the last sentence. I've been a lifelong tennis player and lived in a number of communities through the years, but I have never had to play on courts in such poor condition. Some people said, well, go play at Ohio University. Well, I played a lot of golf over there, and I went and looked at their courts the other day, and they're absolutely horrible. They have cracks in those courts. They're anywhere from a half to three-quarter inches uh, wide. So this is what they put together. Uh, the tennis courts would be our responsibility. Sorry. Would be our responsibility in terms of paying for them. But if you remember our meeting a couple ago, Andrew Chickie in the seven three fund over between nine hundred and a million dollars for projects such as this. So I'll uh, I'll, I'll, I'll relinquish the floor to Greg because uh, he's much more uh, involved and an expert on courts and court sports than than, than I. Well, ba based on the picture, I mean, that's that's a dream come true. But so really the bottom line is uh, to hear yes or no. Do we have the money? If the answer is yes, then what does it take to get the process started that these may come about in, by the year, you know, 2022? Uh, because I know when it's city stuff that it takes a lot of time and paperwork and you know, bidding and whatnot. Um, so if we have the money, uh, let's start the ball rolling on, on getting what that picture done. I mean, that's, that's it in a nutshell. There's no sense in talking about, you know, what I'm seeing. Uh, what I see is what we've heard for years. 
And now if the money is available, I'll leave it up to Terry to say, here's what I need to do to start the process. And I like to be kept in the loop as the process goes on, especially in the bidding process, so that the courts aren't put in by driveway people, but professional court people. And that's all I have to say. So sorry about the barking dog, if you heard that. Um, <laughs> uh, I have rough estimates for costs um, for the new tennis courts. Uh, so when we, when we say, is the money available, we have funds in our new levy money uh, fund, which is 273. Uh, there is money there. And uh, I would like to get uh, and another estimate with that third court, uh, it's my thought that we're looking at probably two hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's was was with with two hundred to two hundred fifty thousand dollars with the two courts and then the four pickleball courts. That third court, I'm not sure. Um, as far as the bid process, we may or may not have to go out to bid. There is a government contract. Um, with uh, different vendors and contractors through Sourcewell. Um, so yeah, I can start the conversation and, and I'll say that um, it's a reputable company out of Columbus that I spoke with um, that builds tennis courts. Um, of course we wanna shop that um, if, if we feel like we need to or if we're getting something comparable um, from this company that is on the source well government contract list um it would probably expedite it um so i i guess you know my thought is is that a direction that the advisory board would like you know like me to go and start getting some some ballpark quotes um, i think we've identified that we want the three and four um i'm agreeable uh that that and, and feel like good justification is that um, there's the potential for revenue, uh, especially with the pickleball courts. So, you know, I've said before that the um, pickleball is one of the fastest growing sports. Uh, Greg, I'll defer to you as far as tennis. Um, but um, yeah, I'm just uh, looking for the advice of the advisory board if that's something you want me to move forward with and start start working with you know different companies and getting. Um, some idea of what uh, what this is going to cost, and then pulling the specs together and um, moving forward with it. Do you have the name of the Columbus company? I I don't have my notes in front of me, and I wrote it down this morning. Uh, they've been in business for like thirty years. They're probably the ones that are coming down to do resurface OU courts in May. Um, but do you have that name right offhand? That's approved by the. The, the bid comp, you know, the bid procedure, folks. I'm looking. I'm looking through my phone now. Um, I'll put it in the chat if I if I find it, Greg. Uh, I don't think it's the same company that's resurfacing. So, in terms of this project and official action. Um, it's my understanding that this solar array is going to be installed in 2021, this year. Um, there are two separate projects, but it seems like if we're putting up fences and moving fences and doing all of that, it would make sense to try to do these projects at roughly the same time, particularly if we have to do any grading or anything like that. So to make it official uh, and, and for the APR board uh, to make a statement, I think it'd probably be appropriate to have an, a, a, someone to make a motion, someone to second that motion. And once we've done that, have any additional discussion and then take a vote. Uh, if we're following Robert's rules of order, that would be the, uh, the, that would be the procedure. So with that in mind, I, I would uh, open the floor for anyone who would like to make a motion to uh, direct, uh, to recommend, because we can't direct, to recommend 
that uh, uh, Terry, as director of APR, uh, pursue the uh, bid slash exploratory process to get the ball rolling on this. So we can clean up the wordsmithing later, but uh, let's get this official and then discuss it and take a vote. So I would uh, entertain a motion to that effect. I move that the director of, of APR, Terry Moore, proceed with um, the bid process in order to find out what it's going to cost for three tennis courts and three dedicated pickleball courts. Is there a second? Second. Travis second. Very good. And because this is recorded, uh, don't worry about the phrasing and all that. Caitlin will be able to watch this to take notes and put that motion into uh, you know, proper form. Any discussion on this? We, we've had a lot of discussion in terms of the, the positives of it. And for it, or does anyone have any comments uh, to the contrary? Anything we haven't thought about that might be negatives or drawbacks? Well, when you're talking about fencing and trying to do it all at once, if they're going to have fencing along the tennis courts, uh, it could be a fence that separates the solar uh, section from the tennis court. So I think that should be coordinated, that one long section of fence, uh, unless the fencing for the solar area it doesn't need to be as high as a tennis court fencing. That's something that the court builders, uh, and Terry, I think the name of that company is Total Tennis out of Columbus, Ohio. I found my notes. But um, yeah, if, if that can be done rather than have two separate fences, but if we have to have two separate fences, so be it. But we could have one tall fence, which would be the tennis pickleball fencing that would also block that section of the solar uh, whereas they may might not need eight or 10 foot high fencing on all the other solar sections. Um, but that one should uh, be on the tennis side yeah. and the rest of the dog park might not have to be eight to 10 feet as well. Now this particular area right here, Greg, perhaps could be shared fencing, but yeah, we yeah. can coordinate yes. with them. Okay. And, but yeah. And that's not that big a deal to, to separately have to put another second section of fence right there. Uh, if the tennis construction people decide that it needs to be that tall and it can also drop down in an L shape because it doesn't have to be that tall for a pickleball court area. If you look at uh, Google image pictures of pickleball courts, they're not that high uh, as tennis courts. But again, as this process continues, I, I would like to be kept in the loop of what goes on. So just as uh Daniel uh, is going to be very much involved in this bike path discussion, all that. Uh, Greg, would I hear you saying you're willing to be the point person uh, for the tennis as part of this? Absolutely. Very good. Okay. Any other comments to add to this? Point something out we haven't thought about? If not, all those in favor of the motion as presented by Greg signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed, same sign. All right, very good. Uh, last item under the parks, uh, back to back to Daniel. And I can't pronounce that word, Daniel, so I'm just going to say invasives and let you take it from there. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, I was recently talking to somebody who mentioned um, lesser celandine, which I – hadn't heard of before I've seen it unknowingly. Um, but it is a small or herb herbaceous invasive plant. Um, I sent a link to Alan. That was a good, good article for, a, from Ohio state that describes it. Um, basically it grows as like a mat. It's real low growing to the ground. It will develop pretty, uh, intensive root system. So it's hard to eliminate it once it's in place. Cause if you don't get all the roots with a lot of the invasives, they'll persist. Um, so what she was telling me was that, uh, she had sent that link to Athens city council and they had 
reviewed it and uh there was somebody who is a local wildflower uh expert or knowledgeable and they suggested that it would be manually removed uh, versus using herbicide which i would agree with just based on my experience with invasives because as i mentioned unless you get the root system for most of them they they can come and will come back um it was noted that it's in the area in cells park where when you first when you're taking the uh concrete pathway up to the left there's a uh a cut through that's become a dirt path between that. And I, she said it was in that area. So to me, it sounds like it's early and it's not, uh, you know, it hasn't become too, uh, too much, too much of it now that it would be, um, the time to try to remove it before it gets actually gets a stronghold and then it will become much dif more difficult, but you can see the problem with this. It's nice. It looks nice, but then you, your, uh, native plants can't grow. They can't, they can't penetrate that. Um, and so you end up losing a lot of diversity. Um, so yeah, that was, you know, I wanted to bring it up and see if there's, if there is, uh, and there might be somebody already taking action on this, but now it's time. I mean, with the garlic mustard and other invasives, you can get them before they seed, uh, then you're going to prevent even more spread. But yeah, that's a great image of the roots. I mean, they, they become pretty, pretty intensive. And, and Daniel's point is well taken. I, I've seen this before, but with these pretty yellow flowers, I thought these were pretty yellow flowers. But after reading the article he sent me, this stuff ends up being uh, very, very thick, and it literally chokes out everything else. And once established, uh, it's not going to go away. So I guess my question, Terry, on things like this in our parks, uh, we, we certainly can't expect Kevin and his crew to go up there and and, and, and spend days and days and days and days of pulling this out uh, and doing the mowing of the cemeteries and the dog parks and the ball fields and everything else that they do. What can, any suggestions that you may have heard from other parks organizations or from your experience to, to address things like this? A any ideas that you've come across that, that, that might help us? Before, as Daniel said, this thing, no pun intended, really takes root. So, I mean, a lot of times they're volunteer groups and, you know, there's work cycles to remove things like that. Um, we don't have, I mean, we have groups that we work with, volunteer groups um, on different projects, but as far as um, park projects per se, we don't have that, um, we don't have that volunteer group established. Uh, we've, um, um, Ann Bonner is is a good resource uh, for um, identifying and pulling together people um, from, I think it's ODNR, to help us come up with a plan or strategy. Um, we worked closely with her, the area behind the community center along the river um, that is one of the mayor's projects uh, where the invasives are. We work closely with that group. There's been a series of meetings. Um, we can typically put somebody on staff as the point person. Um, I mean, it can be Kevin. In the past, we've had um, our groundskeeper, or lands, our uh, head landscaper, that would would uh, that I see taking the lead on those projects and pulling those volunteers to together, or uh, other organizations to help us. Um, again, I think we would have the support from ODNR. Um, but as f I'd like to get up there and look at it with Kevin, uh, he's pretty knowledgeable. 
and then kind of talk through, you know, what, what that might take to get that out of there um, specifically. Um, I know, I mean, Daniel's been removing invasives in, at Camp Rotan, and we've got that area behind the community center that are much bigger projects um, and would require, would actually require the, the, the project behind uh, the community center along the river would actually require some spraying, um, as I understand, to do it. Um, and have it be effective as an initial treatment. So uh, let me um, let me get up there with Kevin, and then I can reach out Daniel to you know if or have him reach out if he has more questions, um, or maybe all three of us meet on site. Uh, and if it you know if it's not a big project, yes, we can we can probably get in there. And how do you keep it from coming back? That's the question. Those are the things I don't know. If we pull it. Um, how do we keep it from, from coming back? You, yeah, well, what I found with other things is, uh, if you pull it, then you just, you have to monitor it, at least that area. And then you'll have when when stragglers come back, you just got to get them. I mean, I think the, the big thing would be, it'd be nice to get some people in there just to, to pull whatever we could get. Um, and I would definitely be willing to meet if, if the timing works, um, and help out with that. So. Daniel, is this something a bunch of kids could do? Yeah. Oh yeah. I had my, I had my daughters helping me pull out garlic mustard at my, in my yard and they're great. I showed them, uh, how to get the roots, get down and get the roots so they don't break off. Cause with that, if you pull it, you know, it's great. It breaks off right at the root and then the root's still there. And it, I mean, that's why these plants do so well. They have all these adaptations that work in their benefit. So yeah, kids can help. I think that would be excellent. And as long, you know, if there's someone to show them what you're looking for and what to do, um, they get into it a lot. So that would be a kind of a fun opportunity too to have kids. What's the, the reason I ask that is that you know that the that the Far East Side Neighborhood Association is a very, very, very active neighborhood association. And tomorrow is the last day of school. Mm -hmm. There must be 70 kids in this neighborhood of school age, uh, looking at the number of heads I see on the bus when they go by. This might be something working through with, with somebody could go up and show them what to do that we could organize over the uh the far east side neighborhood facebook page in a matter of a day or so but again they would need some direction and and all of that so if it's you think it's something kids can do if somebody can identify the area we can get somebody who can kind of show us what to do i think we could probably get 25 30 kids up there and hopefully in a, in a few hours uh really put a dent in this if not begin to eradicate the problem because it's right here in our neighborhood yeah that's a great idea and Al alan alan to that point um if we need to incentivize that and the kids that participate in that project um we can we can certainly offer a free pool pass um that would be great that would be great so reward for me so, Daniel, real quick, I don't want to belabor the point. We have a couple more items. Uh, could you uh, shoot me an email exactly where this is, and I'll go up and take a look? Yeah, I, I can do that. Or, I'll, if, or if you had a 15 minutes, could meet there sometime in the next week. And I'm okay. right here in the neighborhood. I'll go up and we can stake it out and see what we can organize. Yeah, that sounds good. I can do that. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, jumping to recreation. Terry, we, jump, we go to you. The big uh, big thing everybody's asking about, eight days. Water in the pool. All right, so <laughs> there's water in the pool. Um, it, it's, it's exciting. Um, we've got head lifeguards on staff. We've got our cashiers. Uh, some of our cashiers, our head cashier, and um, our lifeguards, some of our lifeguards on staff, they've been cleaning and prepping uh, to, um, 
to get things in order. I feel pretty good about where we're at there. Um, Kevin, Kevin has oversight for some of the projects. We've made some concrete repairs. We've painted. Um, and now it's about filling the pool and getting the um, chemicals uh, in the water. Uh, I sat in on, you know, of course you, you don't think you feel like you're where you need to be, but I sat in on a regional meeting this morning with directors, um, gosh, from Upper Arlington on down, I think, and um, you know, there's still question and concern and decisions that haven't been made with a lot of agencies because of the um, capacity restrictions or opening as normal. Um, so there was discussion around that. Um, if they're just opening for reservations, members only, uh, those types of things. I feel like we've, um, you know, that that um, we're in a good a good place. Um, in, in the direction we want to move uh, and and the direction I've I've received from the mayor and Jack Pepper um, just receiving that information today um, about opening um, I'll share I'll share that um, on Monday uh, Monday night city council will take up an amendment um, to the city mask ordinance to include the CDC guidelines for vaccinated people not having to wear a mask. As for limited capacity, as of June 2nd, there won't be COVID related capacity limitations. That echoes um, what Jack Pepper has, has advised. The city can or be, uh, be at normal capacity as of June 2nd. Our quandary, is what do we do those first three days yeah. because the order hasn't been lifted. <laughs> so um, we, I talked about that with staff and the head guards and, you know, do we open to members only? Do we just open at that 35% capacity um, over Memorial Day weekend? Uh, you know, I, if anybody wants to weigh in on that, um, that's a decision that we face. Uh, we, we went with a recommendation of the advisory board as far as resident, non-resident fee. Um, there were no other changes. Uh, in meeting with the head guards um, they, and, and other staff, um, they felt like they wanted, did not want to go with sessions um, this season. And I wanted to, you know, bring that back to the board um, as well. Um, but other than that, everything is in place. I feel, I feel good about where we're at. Um, yeah. So, Terry. So, any thoughts on? Yeah. So, I was going to say to, to your question. So, um, if capacity is not an issue starting July, uh, June second, then that makes sessions a moot point. However, right, we're right, opening the, we're opening the 29th, right? Saturday, the 29th. Correct. So I think the 29th, 30th, 31st, and 1st, those those four days, uh, we're still under the guidelines. So I think for those four days, we're, we're going to have to go sessions. And I, I see a benefit in that. Not only are we complying with the governor's directives, which we should, but secondly, it's kind of like a soft opening for a restaurant. You have a brand new staff. We didn't open last summer. It gives them an opportunity to learn the ropes, to learn the policies and procedures and all of that with a much reduced crowd for those first four days. So it seems to me if it's 35 percent, whatever 35 percent is, when it's full, it's full those first four days. Come back to the next session. I wouldn't try to I wouldn't try for four for four short days, try to do a reservation system or anything. You know, if, if the first session starts at noon and the second session starts at four, 
you come at noon, and if you're in that group, you get in. You come back at four, you're in that group, you get in. But you got to clear in between, and nobody in the first session gets into the second session until all second session people who want to get in have had an opportunity to do it. Four days seems like a, a simple way to, to handle it until the uh, restrictions are off and anybody and everybody can come and pay their, their fee and have a good time. How would you how would you handle um, those that have memberships? Um, you know, we've never done anything really for, I mean, for members um, as far as any type of um, would we let members in? Would you recommend letting members in uh, as part of that thirty five? And it could incentivize folks to buy memberships. Again, we're only talking encourage. Yeah. Again, we're only talking four days. If you have a membership, and so let's just pick a number. Let's say 35% is 200 people. I'm just picking a number. At 12 o'clock. 280. Yeah, well, I'm just, I'm just using that as an example, okay? So let's say the number is 200 per session. First 200 people in the door, membership or not, get in at 12 o'clock. Four o'clock, 200 people, member or not, get in the door. Uh, because again, we're only talking four days, and it would seem uh, let's see we've spent a lot of time and energy what ifing coming up with policies for only four days. People will get over it. I don't know, that's my two cents worked out. Uh, I'd like to hear from others. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we, yeah, no, I wouldn't spend a lot of time. Uh, going over all kinds of things we ought to do for four days, for four days worth. It could rain those four days. It could uh, be cold those four days. I, I think we should keep it as simple as possible, other than the fact of letting people know that it's a four day soft opening and it's wide open on the fifth day so that they know on the fifth day anything goes. Just say soft opening may whatever tell June whatever. And then as of, you know, just let them know with a signage at the pool or whatever. But I, I love Alan's ideas. Just four days. If you're going to upset people in four days, they'll get over it on the fifth. <laughs> All right. I'm taking that back to my team. Anybody else have any comments with regard to that? Um if not, I'll give some updates on swim lessons. Uh, we are currently 64% full, um, which, uh, and we're going to do something different this year. We're going to swim test the kids uh, in advance of their session. We're going to, we have an open date at the facility to swim test kids. Um, so we know where they're at day one. Parents know where they are at day one. They can come in, see the facility. We swim test them. Um, something else that we're doing as far as public swim is, um, we'll have bands for kids 12 and I think it's 12 and over that have passed the swim test for the deep end. Um, in the past, we've had um, uh, parents that want to swim in the deep end with their child. Uh, we have a different color band for kids that are swimming with their parent but working towards passing the swim test. So I feel like we've accommodated both there. Um, yeah, so we've just added a different color band and a measure to accommodate um, parents that want to um, swim with their child in the deep end. That is a visual for our lifeguards. Um, as part of that policy, we also have the opportunity to, to, to pull that band um, on, on, um, from the parent-child if, if we feel like... Um, what we get sometimes is you, you've got parents that are very good at watching their kids and, and, and being attentive, but then you have others that 
um, rely heavily on the lifeguards. Um, and that was my biggest concern when the head guards brought, you know, brought it to me. I said, okay, then we can try it this way, um, where we issue that band, but we can also pull that band if need, if need be, um, if we feel like the child isn't a strong enough swimmer or that they need further, further guidance, um, or more guidance than, than we, we can offer um, in that area of the pool. The kids can swim in the leisure pool, splash pad, top pool, but the deep end is where we will take those precautions, continue to take those precautions and take measures um, for swim testing. I think it's 12, 12 and under. We're 12 and over, I'm sorry. Great idea, love it. Yeah. Okay, Terry, anything else you'd like to share with us today? I think, um, yes, I want to share um, the status of Arts West. For those of, that you, uh, of you that don't know, there was an accident at that facility. A vehicle ran into the building, um, into the lower level. Uh, I have a report from facilities. Um, Andrew Chickey is, is working through. Uh, we don't have the final damage estimate um, from the claims adjuster, but we do have the in engineer structural assessment. It looks like it's about $100,000, give or take, um, and it's gonna require some structural bracing. Uh, I will keep you posted on, on when that work will start. Um, right now, the building's boarded up. We're not using certain areas. Um, with that said, at Arts West, um, we have wrapped up, or we're wrapping up Crafter Noons. Uh, I know Emily is working on a um, possibility of an art camp uh, over or during the July 4th weekend. Um, Let's see. Summer camp. Um, was the driver insured? Yes, I believe so. Okay, so that's not coming so. out of our pocket yet. No. Okay. No. To what extent? I'm not sure. To the level of coverage, I'm not sure. Um, and I can, I can, I can check with Andrew on that. Um, but. To my knowledge, um, no, it's no no expense, no cost to us. Uh, our summer camp is 100% full. Um, we've got 56 kids each week. Aaron Helms is overseeing that this year. Um, we have successively su successfully run uh, Start Smart Baseball and our Start Smart soccer programs and basketball programs, um, our Start Smart programs are well received and well participated in. We could probably offer another three or four or five and, and, and uh, we'd have those classes um, filled. We are using um, OU coaching staff and students, uh, so we don't have the expense of an instructor. Um, just Erin's oversight and guidance once she gets those instructors trained. Um, so the, and they're getting experience and credit for that. Great. That's it. Pool summer camp. Um, yeah, we are. You know, this next this next week that that that's our focus. Uh, I can say I feel fortunate that we have 25 lifeguards hired. The call today, um, there were some facilities that weren't opening on time because they didn't have staff or they weren't offering certain um, services because they didn't have staff. Um, there were probably three or four different cities that um, are still struggling to get, to get staff. Uh, so I feel good about where we're at. Um, we're offering a lifeguard class, certifying six new lifeguards on Saturday and Sunday. Um, and then we've got probably, I want to say, five to six um, water safety instructors that will be certified the next week. Uh, we partner with the city of, of Lancaster um, to 
have that make that training available to our um, our W our, to our our staff that wanted to be certified as water safety instructors. Um, it's, it's a model I like. Um, it's to the Red Cross standard, and I feel like it makes our swim lesson program um, quality program and, and very credible with with our instructors having that water safety instruction. So, right, any good. questions for me about any any other areas? All right, thank you, Terry. One other quick thing, um, I, I emailed uh, Ron Lucas, HR director today. We've had some uh, questions and concerns about uh, keep, keeping up with our grounds and maintenance and all of that. And as you all know, we are uh, understaffed at this point in time. But very quickly, uh, this is from Ron. Currently, there are four seasonal maintenance staff at Arts, Parks, and Recreation. The fourth just started this morning. We are awaiting a response from a seasonal maintenance cemeteries position that was offered. We're reviewing applicants for a permanent part-time cemetery maintenance position. I do not know when that will be filled. Our assistant groundskeeper is scheduled to start on June 1st. Our full-time groundskeeper examination is scheduled for Friday, May 28th. That position should be filled by the middle of June. So that's an update where we are in terms of filling these vacant positions that have been vacant for some time. Uh, one person started today. Looks like we'll get another one June 1st and hopefully another one by the middle of uh, middle of June and then one to be determined. Uh, as you well know, uh, we took on cemeteries several years ago, and that is a very, very uh, uh, labor-intensive operation. And just taking them on is one thing, but when we take something on like that, we need the personnel to go with it. So the point in all this is if you are getting any concerns from residents of the city about, about the condition of any of our parks, you can feel free to share this information with them in terms of the hiring plan. Today is the 20th, 11th for the next 26 days. And again, you can always refer them to this video so they can see it firsthand. And again, I received that from uh, Ron Lucas uh, just late this afternoon. Any questions, comments? We have one last thing that should be quick. If you remember uh, the last two years, uh, like city council, we did not meet in the month of July. Uh, I, we, we took our vacation now. We'll go the 11 months, lots of meetings. Uh, any thoughts on continuing that? Uh, taking the month of July off from our meeting uh, as city council does from their meetings uh, in that same month? Or do we need to continue to meet in July? I'm looking for your recommendations and thoughts, please. I'd like to see us meet. I mean, it's it's a heavy parks and recreation month of, of use. Okay. And, and very well, well, we, if we, very zoom, we can meet from anywhere. <laughs> That's true. That, uh, that is true. And I think if this, uh, or say when this uh, court thing takes off, we, we might very well have to meet. So good, good point, Greg. Other thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I would be able to, so I don't have a problem with that. I'm okay with it. All right. And as someone mentioned, uh, if you're doing it by Zoom, it kind of makes it a little bit easier rather than driving into a, to a meeting. So, yeah, we'll just plan on doing that then. Sounds good. Anything else for the good of the order, or could I get a motion to adjourn? I move we adjourn the, this evening's meeting. Um, can we have a second? I'll second. All those in favor, signify saying aye. Aye.